hello students welcome to chapter 17 concepts of care for patients with allergy and immunity conditions and as i review in class uh, the most important topics and concepts anaphylaxis angioedema autoimmunity post-exposure prophylaxis pip pre-exposure prophylaxis prep retrovirus these are concepts that you can review in your textbook okay and make sure you understand and master the knowledge behind so then uh, we're going to start talking about hypersensitivities allergies these are responses that are excessive widespread or directed against normal body tissues damage can result because of this overreaction right hypersensitivity also known as allergy occurs in the presence of an allergen to which the patient usually has been previously exposed characterized by overactive immunity and excessive inflammation so it's overactive immunity um, an allergen is an, uh, is an antigen, and remember that I told you in class, G of antigen means that there is a guest, it's an external uh, visitor, right, that triggers excessive inflammation or immunity uh, overreactions only in susceptible individuals. People encounter allergies in these ways, inhaled, plants, pollens, ingested, foods, injected insect or other venom drugs biologic substances or contacted via skin or mucous membranes so um this can trigger itchy watery eyes or sneezing to life-threatening reactions allergic asthma angioedema those concepts that we are going to review in a few minutes okay these reactions are classified into four uh, basic types and um, uh, also i want you to remember that allergies uh, are genetic specific allergies are not inherited uh, for example a woman who has an allergy to penicillin uh, but not to peanuts may have a child with an allergy to peanuts but not um, to penicillin so that's something that you need to master you need to know it's good that you remember the difference right so let's continue with the next topic remember the hypersensitivities are going to be manifested in four basic types we have type 1 type 2 type 3 and type 4 okay let's review this perfect let's go to the next segment in the book um okay we are waiting for that so we have type 1 or anaphylactic response type 2 cytotoxic and we rem remember i explained cyto is related to the cells type 3 or immunocomplex reaction and type 4 or delay hypersensitivity reaction so right now we're going to review the video right in which we are going to see the four um hypersensitivities here we go with the video Hypersensitivity refers to abnormal reactions of the immune system against certain antigens. It includes reactions to otherwise harmless environmental antigens, commonly known as allergies, and inappropriate reactions against the body's own antigens, or autoimmune diseases. Reactions can range from a mild rash to damaged organs to fatal anaphylactic shock. There are two principal groups of factors contributing to hypersensitivity. Imbalance between effectors and regulators of immune response. In some people, mechanisms that normally moderate the immune system are compromised, causing it to overreact to harmless non-infectious antigens. Self-reactivity of immune cells. During their development in the thymus and bone marrow, T cells and B cells learn to not react to the body's own antigens. Self-reactive cells are normally eliminated, 
but in some people, some of these cells escape and may attack their own tissues once activated. Hypersensitivity reactions only occur in pre-sensitized individuals. Patients must have had a previous contact with the antigen, which produced no symptoms, but during which the body had started making antibodies or activated immune cells that may cause symptoms in subsequent exposures to the same antigen. Hypersensitivity is classified into four types based on mechanisms of action. In type 1 hypersensitivity, a previous exposure to the antigen results in production of a class of antibodies called IgE. IgE molecules bind to their receptors on the surface of mast cells and basophils. Upon re-exposure to the same antigen, or sometimes a similar antigen, the antigen binds to adjacent IgE molecules, bringing their receptors together, triggering a signaling cascade that induces the release of histamine and other inflammatory chem okay. chemicals. These chemicals cause dilation of blood vessels, smooth muscle spasms, and are responsible for symptoms such as edema, rash, difficulty breathing due to bronchospasm, abdominal cramping, vomiting, and diarrhea. The reactions are immediate within minutes of contact with the antigen and can range from mild to severe. Severe reactions may lead to anaphylactic shock, a life-threatening condition in which blood pressure drops and airways narrow to a dangerous level. Most allergies are type 1 hypersensitivity reactions. In type 2 hypersensitivity, previously formed IgG or IgM antibodies bind to antigens on the surface of a particular cell type. Antibody binding marks the cells for destruction, either by the complement system or phagocytosis. The antibodies may also interfere with normal functions of the cells without killing them. Type 2 is at the basis of many autoimmune diseases, where the body produces antibodies to destroy its own cells. Another example is hemolytic disease of the newborn where maternal antibodies bind to D antigen on the surface of fetal red blood cells and destroy them. Type 3 hypersensitivity reactions are also mediated by IgM or IgG, but in this case, the antibodies bind to free-floating antigens, forming antibody-antigen complexes. The complement system is activated and inflammation results, causing damage to the affected tissue. A typical example is serum sickness, induced by a large amount of antigens in the blood. Immune complexes are deposited in the walls of blood vessels, triggering their inflammation or vasculitis. Type 4 hypersensitivity is a delayed reaction, mediated by T cells. Pre-sensitized T cells are produced during a previous contact with the antigen. Upon re-exposure to the same antigen, T helper cells release inflammatory cytokines, while T killers induce cytotoxic reactions. Typical examples are allergic reactions to substances that come into direct contact with the skin, known as contact dermatitis. Type 4 is also the basis of the tuberculosis skin test. Thank you so much. This was very helpful. Just remember type 1 is related to IgE antibodies, okay, and the response, the reaction is going to be immediate, immediately reaction. Type 2, we have IgG, IgM, okay, and here I want you to remember blood transfusions and hemolytic anemia on um, type 3. We have a more complex reaction. Also, um, we have the participation of IgG and IgM, the same as type 2. And I want you to remember rheumatoid arthritis, okay, and systemic lupus erythematosus. In type 4, there is no IgG that participates, but I want you to remember that the response, the reaction is delayed between 12 and 72 hours, okay, and uh, a common uh, example is uh, poison IV and also the tuberculosis skin test. Okay, let's go back to the book. Thank you so much for the video. 
But also, um, I wanna uh, clarify, and I also wanna share information about the IGMs. Okay, the IgGs. So we have five, the immunoglobulins. We have the IgG, which which counts for around 75% of all antibodies in the human body, depending on the antigen. IgG can either attack a pathogen, so other immune cells, and proteins will recognize it, or it can activate the complement system to directly destroy the microorganism. Okay, so most important, IgG can sometimes trigger an undesirable response in people with autoimmune diseases, in which the immune system inadvertently attacks its own cells and tissues. So then we have the immunoglobulin IgA, okay, is primarily found in mucosal tissues, such as those in the mouth, vagina, and intestines, as well as in saliva, tears, and breast milk. It accounts for 15% of all antibodies in the human body, and it's produced by B cells and secreted from the lamina propria, a thin layer within mucosal tissues. So IgA is one of the body's first line defenses against infection. It binds to pathogens to tag them for destruction and prevents them from sticking to the epithelium, which lines the body tissues. It's also associated with hypersensitivity reaction in people with celiac disease and several other autoimmune disorders, okay? So IgA related to celiac. And makes sense because it is um, the location in which IgA lives is in the mucosal, right? So celiac is inside of the gastrointestinal system. IgM is also one of the first antibodies recruited by the immune system to fight infections. IgM population rise very quickly when the body is first confronted with an infection organism. And then they plant as IgG antibodies take over. IgM is also produced by B cells and when bound to pathogens will spur other antibodies and immune cells into action. So in addition to activating the immune response, a subset of IgM helps B cells remember a pathogen after it has been destroyed. If you were to become re-exposed to the pathogen later, your immune system should respond more quickly due to the memory B cells. And then we have the immunoglobulin E, IgG, IgE is the antibody responsible for the allergic response that is mostly found in the lungs, skin, and mucosal membranes, right? It's produced by B cells secreted by lymph nodes and other lymphoid tissues situated near the site of the allergen. And when IgE binds to an allergen, it triggers a cascade of events, vasophils and mast cells, which are subtypes of uh, WBCs. Remember, your nurse love to monitor neutrophils, lymphocytes, monocytes, and then you have vasophils and eosinophils, right? Degranulate, break down, and release histamine. And we know that histamine lives in the connective tissues. An inflammatory compound into the bloodstream, it is histamine that is responsible for many of the most common on symptoms of allergy. So in summary, IgE also helps to protect the body from parasitic infections, including helminths, parasitic worms, okay? And then we have immunoglobulin IgD that is important in the early stages of the immune response. And then IgD counts for only 0.25% of antibodies in the human body. Despite its vital role in kickstarting the immune response, IgD is arguably the least understood antibody with little known about how it might participate in other parts of the immune system. Okay, so there you go. You have this um, very nice page in verywealthhealth.com and the title is What are the five types of antibodies? Let's go back to the book. So now you have the complete picture between the participation of the immunoglobulins and the types of hypersensitivity reactions, okay? Um, so then, um, important to remember, uh, type one reaction result from the increased production of immunoglobulin IgE, 
right? And there is a participation of histamines and examples of these reactions is latex, venom, peanuts, iodine, selfish, and certain drugs. And we're going to find a table um, farther in this chapter with all that uh, summary, okay? Um, also, I want you to remember that other reactions may lead to anaphylaxis with involvement of all blood vessels and bronchiolar smooth muscles, causing widespread blood vessel dilation, decreased cardiac output, and bronchoconstrictions, right? So, um, this is anaphylaxis, and I don't want you to get confused uh, between anaphylaxis and anaphylactic shock. Um, anaphylaxis is a severe life-threatening generalized or systemic rapid onset hypersensitivity reaction, while anaphylactic shock is a severe rapidly progressing anaphylactic reaction resulting in a life-threatening drop in blood pressure. So there you go, that's the difference, right? We're going to see a um, drop in blood pressure in anaphylactic shock besides the other symptoms. Um, so then let's move forward. Um, so then in the first reaction, uh, the warm swelling pain, nasal and conjunctival, conjunctival mucus secretion, itching and redness or pigment changes that last about 10 minutes. So here they are describing the rapid uh, reaction in type one. Let's move to type two or cytotoxic mediator response occur when the body makes autoantibodies directed against self cells that have some form of attached foreign protein. So the autoantibody binds to the self cell and form an immune complex. The self cell is then destroyed along with the attached protein. Select examples of type two reaction include hemolytic anemia and hemolytic transfusion reaction. When a patient receives the wrong blood type during a transfusion, as I mentioned when we were watching the videos, right? And that's good to know because it's the most common type of type two hypersensitivity reaction. In type three or immune complex reaction, we have an excess antigen causing immune complexes to form in the blood. So these immune complexes are the result of the um, very complex reaction uh, in type three. That's why the most common are rheumatoid arthritis, which is a systemic, right? It's very complex uh, disease. And also lupus um, erythematosus, okay? Um, so the most uh, autoimmune disorders are caused by type three reactions, for example, the systems of lupus and rheumatoid. In type four, hypersensitivity reactions, also called delayed type hypersensitivity reactions. These occur um, between 12 and 72 hours following exposure, right? And um, following exposure, sensitized T lymphocytes respond by releasing chemical mediators and trigger macrophages to destroy the antigens, right? And we know the macrophages are the ones that are engulfing all these antigens. This type of reaction is characterized by edema, induration, ischemia, and tissue damage at the site of the exposure. It resolves usually over five to seven days, so it's is a, a good a good amount of time with symptomatic treatment corticosteroids can reduce discomfort yet histamine antagonists such as benadryl do not help because histamine is not the main mediator of this type of reaction because IgE does not cause this type of reaction because we remember IgE is involved in type 1. The sensitization does not reduce the response. So skin irritations that arise following exposure to poison IV, for example, or certain jewelry metals, local response to insects, stings, and sarcoidosis, right? Uh, and that's good to know. Now let's move to general allergy testing. Um, in a skin print test, a very small amount of a potential allergen is pricked into the skin. Here is a brief description of how the skin prick test is done. 
This test is used most commonly for environmental or food allergies, intradermal tests in which a small amount of potential allergen is injected just below the skin surface are used to determine allergies to insects, bites, and penicillin. So very good, let's move to angioedema. So the pathophysiology uh, of this condition is a severe type 1 hypersensitivity, right? Angioedema type 1 that involves the blood vessels and all layers of the skin, mucous membranes and subcutaneous tissues in the affected area, okay? So the angioedema response is a deep tissue problem of IgE-mediated release of inflammatory proteins, especially in bradykins. So this is a reminder, right? Angioedema type 1, IgE participant. Although angioedema can occur in part of the body, it is more often seen on the lips, face, tongue, larynx, and neck. It can occur also in the arms, hands, legs, feet, or genitals. Wow. Intestinal angioedema can also occur characterized by severe abdominal pain, cramping, nausea, and vomiting. So imagine the angioedema in the face and the lips and translate that to the gastrointestinal. Wow, amazing. Exposure to any ingested drug or chemical can cause angioedema. The most common drugs associated with angioedema and angiotensin converting your ACE inhibitors and your NSAIDs. So let me summarize, and this is an NCLEX alert that's good to know. Your PRILs, which is your ACE, um, the, the ones that produce the persistent dry cough, right? and your NSAIDs. So there you go, angioedema, IG participation, type 1 hypersensitivity, and most of the, uh, the most common um, drugs that cause angioedema are your ACE and your NSAIDs. And here you have the table with all type of hypersensitivities with mechanisms, signs and symptoms, examples and nursing interventions. So you have type one anaphylactic, again, is going the, the onset a following exposure is going to be in less than one hour within minutes, IgE participant. You have uh, signs and symptoms, allergic asthma, angioedema, anaphylaxis, and itchy red watery eyes, right? and you have your iodine and so these are patients that are allergic to iodine latex peanuts pollen, and shellfish right and we have to provide rescue interventions immediately for anaphylactic reactions then we have the type 2 to is cytotoxics and we have the intervention of igm and igg even though here they are not mentioning that it's a cytotoxic right um, a reaction is going to be present minutes to hours and the most important I want you to remember especially because this is going to happen in the hospital environment is going to be blood transfusion and hemolytic anemia if that happens you have to discontinue the offended drug or blood product immediately administer the drug therapy and recognize that plasmapheresis right can remove those antibodies autoantibodies okay let's move to type three your um immunocomplex reaction right in which igm and igg are going to participate this is going to happen um, we're going to see the reaction between four to ten days and um, most common are going to be rheumatoid arthritis and your SLE, your systemic lupus erythematoriosus. So at this point, you already know in your mind because I repeated this in class several times. I'm here in the video, so you, I'm expecting you to get a hundred in the exam, okay? <laughs> and now we have the type four, right? Your delay hypersensitivity reaction. Um, we don't have any IgG present, uh, any immunoglobulin present. The reaction is going to be between 12 and 72. So you have your contact dermatitis, your poison IV, right, or psychoidosis. And um, I'm going to share this with you about sarcoidosis. Let's go here. It's a condition, and this is a 
um, reading from the Cleveland Clinic. This is a very nice source. It's a condition that causes lumps or nodules, granulomas, to form in your lungs, lymph nodes, skin, eyes, eyes, and other parts of your body. Symptoms include cough, shortness of breath, tender sores on your shins, eye pain, and redness. Many cases go away on their own or um, with treatment, but sometimes it becomes a chronic condition that, there you go, you have sarcoidosis. Okay, thank you very much for the information. We really appreciate it, Cleveland Clinic. And then he, here you can see a very interesting graphic in which you can see an immune complex in a type 3 hypersensitivity reaction. And also you have here the picture of a patient with angioedema on the face, lips, and mouth. Um, although the greatest risk for angioedema from ACE inhibitors is within the first 24 hours after taking the first dose of offending drug, the reaction can occur even years after therapy was initiated, and that's good to know, NCLEX alert, okay? So um, don't assume because the patient is taking for a week ACE inhibitors that this reaction will never be present. It could take years to be present. Okay, observe the patient carefully for any signs and symptoms of angioedema and laryngeal edema following the first dose. This is in case the patient is prescribed ACE and you are, you know, uh, the nurse um, assessing for this patient. Teach black patients taking ACE about signs of angioedema and the need to call 911 immediately if symptoms appear. Good to know. NCLEX alert. ACE ARPs are recommended at first line agents in black only with comorbidity of chronic kidney disease. Okay, so those are the two medications. First, you need to remember that ACE can cause angioedema how to educate the patient, the signs and symptoms, but also since this is very common in the uh, black American um, community population, you have to teach them that ACE and ARPS, your Losartan, right? Uh, your Prills are the ones uh, that are going to feed the first line agents in blacks only with comorbidity of chronic kidney disease. Okay, assessment, obtain a history to identify potential cause of angioedema. You're going to ask about regular drugs, um, what type of medication they were taking, if this happened before, even if the patient only has lip swelling or a slight itching in the back of the throat, airway blockage can develop quickly, so you have to be alert, okay? Patients with ACE induce angioedema with or without laryngeal edema, have deep film swelling in the face, uh, lips, tongue, and neck. They have difficulty speaking or drinking due to lip stiffness. The face can be so distorted that friends and family may not recognize the patient. Okay, usually the patient with ACE-induced angioedema is diagnosed based on the signs and symptoms. No specific test can diagnose angioedema, so that's why it's critical that you are assessing the patient immediately and valuable time should not be wasted in laboratory testing during an acute episode. So what are we going to do? Take action, implementation, severe angioedema of the face or mouth is an acute emergency. That's good to know. Oxygen by nasal cannula is applied to help maintain gas exchange. That's good to know. Number two, the most commonly other drugs are epinephrine and corticosteroids, right? Because we need to reduce the inflammation. Indications for intubation include the strider, and the inability to swallow, okay? And that's good to know. Number three, drug therapy may be continued for several hours after angioedema has initially resolved. So even if you don't see any more signs and symptoms of angioedema, you have to keep going with the drug therapy. Often the drug that causes the angioedema has a longer half life than the drugs used to treat it. And that's the rationale behind that. Okay, so that's why you need to continue with the drug therapy. 
for several hours. Initial drug therapy can successfully shrink the facial, oral, and airway edema to the extent that symptoms are no longer felt or observed. However, if drug therapy is completely stopped at this point, angioedema can redevelop while the causative drug agent remains on the blood. Very important. Okay, that's part of your nursing interventions. Very important. IV access is maintained and the patient is closely monitored for two to six hours. And the IV access is there just because in case the angioedema redevelops and you need to start another solution. Okay, so all the time you're going to keep the IV access. Be a smart nurse. If laryngeal edema forms an intubation is not possible, an emergency tracheostomy is needed. Location of the tracheostomy incision into the trachea must be below the level of the edema to ensure adequate airflow to the side of gas exchange, right? The most important aspects of care coordination following angioedema and to determine the cause Teach the patient to avoid the offending agent and ensure that the patient knows to seek emergency care immediately if any signs or symptoms of the problems develop. And that's good to know. Very good. So let's move to anaphylaxis. So anaphylaxis is a condition in which a type 1 hypersensitivity reaction involves all blood vessels or bronchiolar smooth muscles. So this is another one, type one, right? We just review on your edema. We know the difference between anaphylaxis and anaphylactic shock. We are getting deep right now into anaphylaxis. We know that type one, it, it has the intervention of IgE, right? So this anaphylaxis uh, causes widespread blood vessel dilation decreased cardiac output and bronchoconstriction. And this occurs at the lungs level within seconds to minutes after allergen exposure. It is the most life-threatening example of a type one hypersensitivity reaction, occurs rapidly and systemically and can be fatal. Okay, the major factor in fatal outcomes of anaphylaxis is a delay in the administration of epinephrine. So the most, the major factor in fatal outcomes of anaphylaxis is a delay in the administration of epinephrine. So we can branch this statement in two pathways. Either it's going to be the patient that is going to, to, to make a delay in the administration of the medication because the patient does not have the epinephrine available or does not know how to use it, or it's gonna be the mistake of the provider or the nurse taking care of the patient, either or, okay? Drugs and injectable imaging can transmedia dyes are some causes of anaphylaxis in acute care settings. Food and in insect stings or bites are common causes in community settings. Okay, let's move to prevention. Teach the patient a history with a history of allergic reactions to avoid known allergens wherever possible to wear a medical alert bracelet, very important, and to alert all healthcare personnel about specific allergies, extremely important. Some patients must carry as prescribed emergency anaphylaxis kit, sometimes called a bee sting kit, although they are frequently used by people with food allergies contains epinephrine and histamine and uh, albuterol, okay? And that's good to know, and Clexaler, you need to know the uh, components of the B stink kit. You're going to have your epinephrine, your antihistamines, and your albuterol, right? Evidence suggests that I am uh, delivery, so intramuscular delivery of epinephrine is more effective than subcutaneous delivery although more conclusive studies are needed. They are taking forever to realize those conclusive studies. It is recommended that patients carry two epinephrines in case a second injection is needed, right? Because remember, we review that in very uh, severe cases, we, we can put up to three 
injections of epinephrine between 5 and 15 minutes, right? And this is something that you know regardless of what unit in the hospital you are going to work. These are life-threatening conditions that you have to put in your mind and you, you, you keep repeating it. The way you know your CPR steps is the same thing with the epinephrine. You are going to come to come across many patients with allergic reactions and you need to know you have to you need to have this knowledge available ready to be used in your mind okay okay patient and family education for automatic epinephrine injectors okay uh, most important is to keep the device with the patient at all times and tell your family and friends where this epinephrine is located keep two drug filled devices with you in case more than one is needed Check the device for expiration, drug clarity, security, or safety release. Be prepared to use the device when um, in any symptom or of anaphylaxis is present and before you call 911. Again, and before you call 911. So if the patient is having an anaphylactic, anaphylaxis reaction, you administer the epinephrine and then you call 911, right? And then... It is better to use the drug when it's, it is not needed than not to use it when it's needed. After using the device, call 911 and get to the nearest hospital immediately, okay? And that's good to know, safety, 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 safety. And then um, patient and family education, use of automatic epinephrine injectors inject the drug into the your middle outer tight at a 90 degree angle that's your intramuscular you can inject the drug right through your pants just avoid seams and pockets where the fabric is thicker hold the injection in place for three seconds following the click sound remove the device from your thigh and massage the injection site for 10 seconds seek medical attention immediately following injection even if you begin to feel better and that's good to know NCLEX alert okay all health records of patients with a history of anaphylaxis should prominent prominently display the list of a specific allergens and this is a nursing priority because you need to know all the history all the characteristics of that particular patient safety 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 NCLEX alert a patient who is allergic to penicillin is also likely to react to cephalosporins because both have a similar chemical structure so there you go another concept that must be in your mind forever and ever regardless of the unit that you're gonna work your epinephrine your penicillin cephalosporin okay your cpr those are basic knowledge and basic concept that you must remember as a nurse as a nurse and you you have to breathe these concepts okay also obtain IV access as order and place intubation equipment and a tracheostomy set at all beds at the at the bedside the patient is often premedicated with diphenhydramine or your benadryl or a corticosteroid prior to receiving the drug or agent that has caused previous complications so it's extremely important safety and NCLEX alert always have your um, all your intubation equipment close to the patient that is having allergies okay so these are three or four concepts that you always need to remember right your CPR your epinephrine how to use it right your IV access at all times your intubation equipment blah 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 and then um, uh, one of the early signs is the patient feeling of apprehension or impending dumb. We are talking about the early signs of anaphylaxis. The patient may appear anxious or concerned, right? Generalized itching and urticaria with subsequent angioedema and redness, hyperpigmentation or hyperpigmentation develop quickly. Histamine and other medic mediators cause inflammation, bronchoconstriction, mucosal edema, and excess mucus production. Respiratory symptoms include congestion, rhinorrhea, and dyspnea. On auscultation, audible wheezing, crackles, and reduced breath sounds can be heard, indicating 
reduce gas exchange. And that's something that you also need to master your lung sounds, your heart sounds, okay? So you can differentiate between whistle, crackles, strider, okay? So key features of anaphylaxis, when one of the two criteria is fulfilled, one of the two, so number one is acute onsets of an illness, minutes to several hours with, with involvement of the skin, mucosal tissue, or both, right? Skin, mucosal tissue, or both. And at least one of these symptoms, airway, breathing, respiratory compromise, or circulation, you're going to see reduced blood pressure or associated symptoms of an organ dysfunction like syncope or incontinence, right? And then um, also other uh, severe GI symptoms like cramping, abdominal pain, prolonged vomiting, or let's go to the other criteria, acute onset of hypotension or bronchospasm or laryngeal involvement, strider, vocal change, odinophagia after exposure to a known or highly probable allergen for that patient means minutes to several hours even in the absence of typical skin involvement, right? And we know hypotension is uh, defined as the decrease in systolic blood pressure more than 30% from patient's baseline or adult systolic blood pressure, my, uh, less than 90, okay? So nursing safety priority, we are still talking about anaphylaxis, right? Remember that? So we are still talking about type 1 hypersensitivity with the participation of IgE. And all records of the patient with a history of anaphylaxis shows prominently displaying the list of specific allergens, right? And um, we are going to um, mention another nursing safety priority, close monitor all patients, closely monitor all patients for early signs of anaphylaxis, especially those receiving a drug that is associated with this condition. And we know those are your A's and your NSAIDs, right? If you suspect anaphylaxis, respond by immediately notifying the rapid response team and administer epinephrine immediately, right? Also, uh, take action. You're going to administer your epinephrine, uh, giving intramuscular for the first line intervention for anaphylaxis. And this drug constricts blood vessels, right? It's going to constrict the blood vessels, improves cardiac construction, and delays the bronchioles. Administration of epinephrine can be repeated every 5 to 15 minutes, and that's good to know. NCLEX alert every 5 to 15 minutes, if needed, up to three doses. So it's going to be... First symptom, you administer your epinephrine, then you call your 911, and you are going to wait between 5 and 15 minutes, depending on the reaction of the patient. You administer the second dose, and then if the um, situation is not getting better, then you're going to administer a third dose between five and 15 minutes, okay? If the patient does not, not respond to IM epinephrine, IV epinephrine may be infused, but that's going to be done by your EMT when they arrive, right? Here you have your graphic about all the organs that are involved in this type of um, anaphylaxis. So you see the respiratory, digestive, upper respiratory, cardiovascular, and the skin, okay? Best practice for patient safety and quality care, emergency care of the patient with anaphylaxis. Uh, if an IV drug or infusing a solution is suspected as the causative agent, immediately discontinue the infusion. Administer epinephrine IM as the first intervention for acute management. I am just uh, reading the most important, but the other factors are also important. I am just going through for me what they are the most important. Repeat the drug every five to 15 minutes. 
um, if three doses of IM epinephrine are not effective, effective then IV epinephrine may be infused. Uh, also, you have to infuse a normal saline and be prepared to administer other drug therapy as ordered, such as albuterol, which is your bronchodilator, your hist antihistamines, uh, glucocorticoids, uh, glucocorticoids, your methylprednisolone, very common in the hospital setting, vasopressors, and glucagon, right? And following the administration of epinephrine, place the patient in the recumbent position with the legs and fin elevated. If needed, an endotracheal tube may be inserted or an emergency tracheostomy may be uh, performed, as we mentioned before. Treat hypotension with a rapid infusion of normal saline. If bronchospasm is present, administer albuterol via nebulizer for inhaler or inhaler, I'm sorry. Antihistamines such as H1 and H2 are used as adjunctive therapies for itching and urticaria. Okay, so these three steps are extremely important, very important because as nurses, you need to know what to do in case of the different symptoms, right? So that's good to know. So in case of um, hypertension, you're going to infuse uh, normal, normal saline, right? That's good to know. Very good. In case of bronchospasm, you are going to give albuterol, right? That's basic knowledge, basic knowledge, okay? You don't have to think too much. And then if the patient is having itching or urticaria, immediately you are going to um, administer antihistamines, right? Drugs used to support cardiovascular function during anaphylaxis are the same as those using hypovolemic shock. Again, drug used to support cardiovascular um function during anaphylaxis are the same as those used in hypovolemic shock. Corticosteroids may be added to emergency interventions, but they are not effective immediately. Oral steroids are continued at lower dose after the anaphylaxis is under control to prevent the late recurrence of symptoms. That's very important. Monitor pulse oximeter to determine gas exchange. Continually assess the respiratory rate and diff and assess breath sounds continually for bronchospasm, wheezing, crackles, and stridor. So those uh, long sounds, it's very important that you can identify with your stethoscopes. Please master your long sounds. Elevate the head of the bed to 45 degrees unless severe hypotension is present. Continually assess for changes in any system and for effects of drug therapy. For severe anaphylaxis, the patient is admitted to an ICU, okay, intensive care unit, ICU. The patient is discharged from the hospital when respiratory and cardiovascular functions have returned to normal. So let's stop here. When we come back, we are going to talk about general autoimmunity. We are in chapter 17. This is a very long chapter, so... Patience is required. Bye-bye.